Well, thank you, Adrian. Well, you are a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All the wonderful things we've learnt from Adrian. So, wow. Welcome, everybody. I'd like to talk today on a topic um, that uh, sort of not on the Father, Son or the character of God, but it's something that I looked at many, many years ago. So I'm just trying to think exactly. It would have been about 1992 I first looked at this. And um, I remember reading a lot of compilations and, uh, and I thought, I'm reading Great Controversy and I'm reading the Bible and I thought, now compilations don't fit in with what I'm reading. And so um, I thought uh, I'd like to investigate this a bit further. So before I start, can we just have a word of prayer? And uh, then I'll get into it. Our Father in heaven, we just want to thank you, Lord, so much for all being here today, to all arriving safely. And Lord, thank you for the lovely sunshine. Mm. Um, it's almost like we've had blasts of winter over the last four weeks, and it's so lovely to have the sunshine shining, and as we just sang in that song. Father, Father in heaven, we just pray that you'll um, help us to get a blessing out of what I'm presenting today. And because we have been told that we need to, to study to show ourselves approved unto God. And why we need to study is because it will strengthen our faith for the times that come. Uh, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I know Jesus, when you were here on this earth, you tried to show your disciples and teach them that they were they really weren't listening to the words that you were saying. And when the time of trial came, it found them unprepared. So, Lord, we, we just would ask that you would help us in this time to, to think about these things and um, maybe do as Mary did, um, ponder them in, in her heart and keep these sayings. Mm -hmm. So we just ask, Lord, that you'll bless this meeting now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> right, so... I'd like to look at the topic of the abomination of desolation spoken of in Matthew, the 24th chapter, in verse 15. And we understand that there's a, a literal and a local application, which was the destruction of Jerusalem. But we also understand that there is a spiritual and worldwide application to the destruction of this world at the end of time. Uh, now, I'd like to share a quote a bit later with you. But there is a specific quote in the spirit of prophecy that tells you exactly what this spiritual worldwide abomination of desolation really is. And uh, so I'm going to try and cover that, which I'll share a bit later. And I want to sort of share what it is, how it comes about, um, when the timing of this is, why God actually allows it to play out the way he does, where it appears, and... Who does it appear to? The who, what, why, when, where, and etc. <laughs> Did I get them all? All the above. All the above. But I want to read to you um, from Gospel Workers a little uh, thing that Ellen White has mentioned here about Matthew 24. And I'll just read this to you. The 24th chapter of Matthew is presented to me again and again as something that is to be brought to the attention of all. We are today living in the time when the predictions of the chapter are fulfilling. Let our ministers and our teachers explain these prophecies to those whom they instruct. Let them leave out of their discourses matters of minor consequence and present the truths that will decide the destiny of souls. Amen. So is this important? Yes. Amen. This is important, Matthew 24. So we're going to go through Matthew 24. And I just want to read a little quote from Desire of Ages, page 628, that says... The entire discourse, is talking about Matthew 24, was given not for the disciples only, but for those who should live in the last scenes of this earth's history. So that's for us. Mm. Okay. Amen. All right. Now, I understand that Matthew 24 is written in chronological order. And I also understand that great controversy, especially, well, I believe the whole thing is chronological, but the last seven chapters have actually been written... If you look at some chapters such as the impending conflict, the final warning or the loud cry chapter, and we have scriptures our safeguard in between that, then we've got the loud cry, and then we have the time of trouble and God's people delivered. It's all been specifically. And as you go through those, if, if you take note, you will find events in each of those sections that are important. Of course, scriptures our safeguard is very important. Okay. Um, just a thought here. Do you realise today how many people on this earth actually believe that Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years on this earth? 
There's a significant number of people. It's going to be a millennial reign of peace, they say. I mean, lots and lots of van evangelicals believe this way. We know the Jehovah's Witnesses, some of the Christadelphians, some of the Brethren. These people all believe these things. And there's a, spirit, a specific quote in the spirit of prophecy that is in great controversy that says this. Uh, and I'll just, I'm just cutting it back. But Protestants, having cast away the shield of truth, will also be deluded. Now, she's uh, adhere, uh, alluring to the fact that the papal church believes in miracles, you know, Mary, etc., and the Protestants have accepted the delusions of spiritualism through the immortality of the soul. And she goes on to say that they will see in this grand movement or, and union a work for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of the long-expected millennium. So all these groups are going to unite. There's going to be Catholicism, Protestantism, spiritualism, and these people are going to usher in a thousand years of peace, so they believe. But is this dangerous? Is anybody going to say is this dangerous? Peace is good. Well, why is it dangerous? Because the scriptures totally contradict it, right? Totally contradict it. And why I'm saying this is they leave themselves wide open to be deceived by the abomination of desolation that is coming. This is why I'm bringing this out. Um, interesting, when I was reading Isaiah chapter 14 just the other day, um, in verse 19, it actually talks about Satan being the abominable branch. branch. And if you read the next verse, in verse 20, it says that he is, the, he is re responsible for destroying the land or desolating the land. And we have learned that Satan is the destroyer, haven't we? We've learned this in our... It's not God. God is not the destroyer. Satan is, is the destroyer. God is the restorer. So scriptures, as this chapter in Great Controversy, scriptures are, are our safeguard. That's why that chapter was written. She wrote this so that we, we need to be fortified with the truths of the Bible. And, and if we really know our Bibles well enough, how does Jesus come? We know he comes literally, visibly, visibly audibly. We know that we could be caught up together with him in the clouds. Dead people will be coming out of their graves, as it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 16 and on. Now, there's a quotation in this book that I don't know whether many people have read. How many people have really got into reading Great Controversy? How many here? Can I show a show of hands? How many people have actually read, say, the last seven chapters recently? No, not recently. I think we, you know, we really need to read this um, because there's so much valuable truth in this book. Okay, um, the quote I want to read, I'm going to read a part of this quote and then I want to read the whole context of it. Uh, this comes from Great Controversy, page 594. It says there, The events connected with the close of probation and the time of trouble are clearly presented. Okay, so clearly presented. But multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. And Satan watches to catch away any impression that might make them wise unto salvation and the time of trouble that's coming on this world will find them unready. Okay, so Satan's, Satan doesn't want you to study. He doesn't want you to understand these things because if you understand them, when these events happen, you'll have faith. You see, this is why God wants us to study. This is why he wants us to treasure up these, store these things in our heart. Now, I'll read the whole context of the quote. Um, before his crucifixion, the Saviour explained to his disciples that he was to be put to death and to rise again from the tomb. And angels were present to impress his words on minds and hearts. But the disciples were looking for temporal deliverance from the Roman yoke and they could not tolerate the thought that he in whom all their hopes centred should suffer an ignominious death. The words which they needed to remember were banished from the mind. See, they were banished. They, they should have remembered these things. And when the time of trial came, it found them unprepared. The death of Jesus has fully destroyed their hopes as if he had not forewarned them. So in the prophecies of the future is open before us as plainly as it was open to the disciples by the words of Christ. Then that continues on the events connected with the close of probation and the time of trouble are clearly presented. Okay, so that's clear, isn't it? That they're there for us. Now, this is an interesting quote from Great Controversy as well. On page 578, it says, We have a chart pointing out every way mark on the heavenward journey, and we ought not to guess at anything. 
So therefore God, just like Jesus told them what was going to happen to him, we've been told what is going to happen for us. Now, why is this important again to study? This, this quotation on page 621 of Great Controversy, further on in Great Controversy, is important. It says, those who exercise but little faith now... What's, what's ex exercising faith mean? Believe the word of trust. Well, yeah, it's ex yes, but it's also, how do we get faith? It comes yeah. hearing. From hearing the word of God. If you're not reading the word of God, you're not really storing faith, are you? And then, of course, you've got to share faith. But those who exercise but little faith now are in the greatest danger of falling under the power of satanic delusions. I want you to remember that word satanic delusions because it ties in with the abomination of desolation and the decree to compel the conscience. And even if they endure the test, we understand the test will come when the world brings together um, Sunday as a day of, of worship. They will be plunged into deeper distress and anguish in the time of trouble because they have never made it a habit to trust in God. Mm -hmm. This is why we need to do it now. We need to gain this faith now. The lessons of faith which they have neglected, they will be forced to learn under a terrible pressure of discouragement. Mm -hmm. So, man, we need to learn the lessons now because when it comes, and if we don't have our Bibles, and if we haven't stored it in our memory, how are we going to bring it back? You know, we need to be able to bring back these precious truths. So none of us need to be deceived, right? Because it, it's been clearly given to us. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. forearmed. And I know there's a couple of people I think will be listening online, and I know that they sort of scare their new people into this. And they're, they're a bit scared of the future events and they, they've just read great controversy, a few of them, and they're, they're a bit worried about the future. But I just want to say in this presentation to them that uh, I just want to say that God is always seeking to save us. God is light. There's no darkness in God. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. Remember these things. Every good gift, you know, every perfect gift comes down from our Father. There's no variableness in God. Uh, he longs to make us happy, doesn't he? He, he, he wishes that, above all things, that we be in health and, and we prosper. And he loves us with an everlasting love. And, and also, I mean, what's the greatest thing that he, he sent his son for us? Um, and why did he send his son? Not to condemn us, or well, not to judge us, but that the world through him might be saved. So, but you know, God understands. Let's just turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. God understands the predicament that we're all in. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3, it says, if, the gospel be, if, our go if this gospel be hid, this good news be hid, it is hid to those that are lost. And why? Because the God of this world has blinded our minds, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto us. So God understands we have this enemy, and it's Satan who, de who delights in uh, deception and in lies, and Let's be honest, every single one of us have believed a false testimony about God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every one of us. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say the majority of our church totally misunderstands God. Um, and we've all had to go through this process of unlearning what we were taught. Um, now let's have a look at the disciples. Um, when Jesus came and, and chose the disciples, they were virtually ignorant. And let's go through some of the things they were ignorant of. Uh, first of all, they were ignorant of his identity, that he was the son of God. They were ignorant of his mission, what his real mission was, and what was it to reveal the truth about his father and to remove the darkness, this misapprehension that had been put upon God. They were totally ignorant about um, the fact that, you know, he was going to be crucified for, now this is interesting, for exposing lies and deception. Once we start exposing lies and deception, the wrath of Satan is unleashed, isn't it? Yes. And because Jesus was unveiling these things, that wrath came on him because he didn't want to be exposed. And also they were ignorant about his resurrection. Um, does this sort of all sound a bit familiar? I mean, the Son of God, um, you know, what his mission, what his character was, etc., etc. I think it's very, I think we've all gone through this. Did they have, was there any reason why they should have been ignorant? No. Is there any reason why we should be ignorant? No, there isn't. But what the problem was, it was a lifetime of their education and their environmental influences that made them believe that the Messiah that was coming was going to be subduing the Romans. And they wanted this because they still had this mentality 
of to you know that God was an inflictor of punishment, and that God was going to get even, and that He was going to pour out retribution on His enemies. And yet, hadn't they sat through the the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said, "What did He say? Love, love your enemies, do good to them that persecute you, pray for them that despitefully use you, that you might be the children of your Father in heaven." But they didn't get it, did they? They didn't get it. They saw truth, but they didn't see it in its right framework. Yes. And it's like a lot of things we've seen, but we haven't seen it in its framework. Mm, true. And Christ came to put it in its right And, and they were blinded to it. Weren't they? they just weren't... They expected him to do other, otherwise to what he was doing. So for three years, Jesus had to re-educate his disciples, which we've been going through this... Actually, we're going longer than three years, right? <laughs> <laughs> Quite a lot longer. <laughs> so he had to say, well, and he asked the question, and he said, who, who am I? And, then, and Peter got it right. Yeah. Peter says, well, you, you know, you're the son of the living God. And he said, well, flesh and blood is not built unto you, but my father in heaven. So he understood it, but he didn't get the sword, did he? Because he cut the ear off not long after, so he didn't get the character part. Um, they were slow to discern the true nature of the kingdom, non-violence. James and John, perfect examples we've discussed. They were told he would be betrayed and killed and rise the third day. But when it happened, they totally forgot. Have a look in John chapter 13 and verse 19. And just, uh, I mean, it's repeated in John chapter 14 and verse 29 as well. But if you turn to John chapter 13 and verse 19, again, Jesus re is repeating that he told them. Let's have a look. John 13, 19, it says there, gee, the words Jesus saying, And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe. So why did he tell them? It was to strengthen their belief in him. But they weren't treasuring these things up. May now, I just inter interrupt? Yes, go ahead. I've only just seen that for the first time. The word he there is sublime. Okay, yeah. You might believe that I am. Yeah, there you go. Wow. Actually, the, same, the more I'm going through the Bible now, the more supplied words I'm finding. Yes. And really, once you leave those out, it changes everything. I know you've, people have discussed these things. Philip still had doubts with the, who the father was. In fact, Nathaniel's faith went beyond Philip's, didn't he? And I think we're told that in Desire of Ages because he came and saw. He didn't think anything good could come out of Nazareth, but he came and saw for himself and he judged for himself. And we know that when uh, the loud cry goes out, everybody's going to get an opportunity to make their own decision. They're going to have to come and see. They're going to hear the arguments and they're going to have to weigh up the arguments because there's going to be a, a multitude in the valley of decision there. And they're going to have to weigh the arguments and study for themselves. Otherwise, they might be deceived. Um, John the Baptist, as we've discussed, didn't understand the true nature of the kingdom. Um, James and John still wanted positions of authority. And, and Adrian's discussed this power, position and authority. They wanted, they wanted all that stuff. And we've talked about Peter who wanted to have a fight. Um, Okay, let's turn to Matthew 24, and we're going to go through this to, the, to, the, to verse number 15. So Matthew 24, and I'll just do the first little bit, and then we'll start in at verses 4 and 5. But um, the disciples came privately to Jesus um, after he said in verse 2 that not one stone would be left of the temple that would not be thrown down. They asked, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And in fact, that word world there is actually age because we know there's going to be an age after this. It's going to be the millennium, the thousand years of peace, right? So that word world there really could be translated age. Now we'll start in it and what I'll do is I'll do the, the local and literal application and the spiritual and worldwide application and we'll go through each as we as we start here. So this one's first of all referring to the destruction of Jerusalem. And we'll start in it here at verse 4 and 5, where Jesus says, Jesus said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now I just want to quote from Desire of Ages, uh, where we're told on page 628, that Christ's words were fulfilled between his death and the siege of Jerusalem, many false messiahs appeared. So between AD 31 and AD 70, many false uh, uh, Christ came, etc. during that time. And she mentions the word deception. This was the very first 
chapter of the Bible, when I was seriously wanting to look at the Bible, when I opened it up, I opened it up to this. That was the very first verse I ever read was um, 4 and 5. And when I read through, it's mentioned four times. So it's really special to me, Matthew 24, because that was my first encounter really seriously wanting to study the Bible. So it mentions deception four times, which is really interesting because we know the abomination of desolation is a deceptive move, which I'll share with you later. So now our time application. So that was the destruction of Jerusalem. There's going to be false prophets. Uh, have a listen here from, again, Desire of Ages, page 628. The warning was given also to those who live in this age of the world. The same deceptions practiced prior to the destruction of Jerusalem will be practiced again. The events that took place at the overthrow of Jerusalem will be repeated. So, and we're seeing a lot of these deceptions with false messiahs, some of the different uh, Pentecostal movements that we see with the false healings. And we know that false healings are going to bring Seventh day Adventists to the test. You know, we're going to be tested over all these false healings. We see uh, healings. Barabbas, who was a political messiah, who was a destroyer. Yes. And many people went with that type yes, of messiah. Yes, that's good. Good point. Very good point. Son of the Father. Yes, yes Son Barabbas. Of the they, that's who they chose. Okay, Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 through to 8. I won't through, read right through here. I'm just going to sort of paraphrase it. You shall hear of wars, rumours of wars, and it says, see that you be not troubled. Okay, so this isn't the end, right? For all things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now, in Desire of Ages, it's bracketed where it says the end of the Jewish nation. Okay, so this is, this is talking about the literal local application, not the spiritual world. What This is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem now. Um, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. And then verse 8 says, these are the beginning of sorrows. Now I want to uh, share something from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary on this, which is talking about these famines, pestilences and earthquakes that were happening back there in Jerusalem. Jewish and Roman writers describe the period from AD 31 to, 70, uh, to AD 70 as a time of great calamities. Uh, particularly severe famine in Judah, about AD 44, is alluded to in Acts 11.28. There were altogether four major famines during the reign of Claudius, and there was a series of earthquakes between AD 31 and AD 70, the worst which was in Crete. And there was also one in Rome and two other different areas. So that's interesting. And then um, Jesus was warning about these sorrows. Now, this is really interesting to me that the, the rabbis were actually saying that all these um, judgments that were coming were because God was angry with the nations because they were holding back and the Messiah wasn't able to come. So they were actually saying God is punishing the nations because, you know, he's you know, not allowing us to um, have rain. But the opposite was the was the truth. And I'll read you a quotation here from Desire of Ages. Christ said, as the rabbis see these signs, they will declare them to be God's judgments upon the nations for holding in bondage his chosen people. They will declare that these signs are the token of the advent of the Messiah. Be not deceived, they are the beginning of his judgments. The signs that they represent as tokens of their release from bondage are signs of their destruction. So they were saying the wrong thing. They, was, they thought it would be the destruction of their enemies when it was going to be their own destruction. Mm. That's sort of serious, isn't it? Mm. Because, they, again, they had this misunderstanding of God. They believed God was a, a God who retaliated. They didn't understand his wrath and how God pulls away. And we know from our studies that God's judgments do not come out directly from the Lord, do they? No. But how do they come out? Well, God warns us. He entreats us. He... He bears long with us, but if we continue on in rebellion, he removes his protection. And yes, Eddie. It is still it's a very legacy in state. And they look at their at the, for example, the Jews looked at the Romans and say it's their fault, we're fine. Yes. Yes. We're we're the chosen and therefore nothing can happen to us. God will protect us no matter no matter what. And that'll be fair as a future. Yes. Um, Ramification. Yeah. Yes. So that was, again, literal and local Jerusalem. Now, the spiritual worldwide application of the abomination of desolation as we're going through Matthew 24. Um, Matthew 24, I'll, I'll read something here This is that is interesting about the famines and that. While these prophecies received a partial fulfilment at the destruction of Jerusalem, they have a more direct application to the last days. 
Today, the signs of the times declare that we are standing at the threshold of great and solemn events. Everything in our world is in agitation. Uh, before our eyes, the Saviour's prophecy of the events to precede his coming, you shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes. Where are these famines, pestilences and earthquakes coming from? Who is doing this? Is this God? No, no, no. okay. Did you want to say something, Craig? No, go ahead. Okay. I've, well, I've got a couple of quotes here. There's two main ones in Great Controversy. It's Satan who works through the elements, also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. He has studied in the laboratories of nature and he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. It is God that shields his creatures and hedges them in from the power of the destroyer, the desolator. And of course, this one you should know, Satan will bring disease and disaster upon popular cities until they are reduced to ruin and desolation. Even now, he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great complications, in fierce tornadoes, terrific hailstones, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves and earthquakes, in every place in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He's the one who sweeps away the ripening harvest and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint and thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations have become more and more frequent and disastrous. And this is the interesting point is that, again, just like the rabbis thought that, well, God is going to punish these people, those, the, that grand movement that we were talking about ushering in the, the millennium, they're the people that are going to turn and say, God is judging us because we're not obeying this particular law that we've set up you know this environmental law this sunday law if you like and it won't cease until we all get together and, and i'll read the quotation and then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve god are causing these evils it will be declared that men are offending god by the violation of this sunday sabbath this environmental sabbath and this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced and that those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are the troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favour. So isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So it's these sorrows that are going to bring about this next, the next part of Matthew 24. Anyway, by the way, who is it? Who is it that brings all the, all the wars where nation rises against nation? Is this God? Um, it's not God, is it? No. Well, who is it? It's, it's Satan. Let's expose him for who he is. I mean, great controversy. <laughs> Satan delights in war, for it excites the worst passions of the soul and then sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. That's what he loves. But, the, but even more than that, it is his object to incite the nations to war against another, for he can thus divert our minds, right, of the people from the work of preparation. Because we're not studying. We're so worried about all the conflicts. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew, don't be worried by all these things. Uh, yes, it's worrying, but don't get caught up in all this war stuff. So many people like, I uh, had a friend send me a text just the other day about China and how China's building up their forces and how... Um, the Philippines and Indonesia want to side with China and now America's worried that there's going to be a, in the China Sea, there's going to be a big conflagration. Well, we're told nation's going to rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, but there's still more stuff to come. This is only the beginning of sorrows, we're told. Don't worry about the black helicopters. Yeah, don't worry about the black helicopters. Worry about the pink ones, because then you'll see them everywhere. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Yes, don't bomb them. Don't. Don't bomb them. Okay, so now we're into Matthew 24 and verse 9. Let's have a look at that verse. So, as I said, it's chronological. You know, there's the literal local application and the spiritual worldwide application. So, we're actually at that, that last one that we just read. The earthquakes, the famines, the pestilences. That's where we are in, in this world's history. The next one, not so nice. Uh, and then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated by all nations, for my name's sake. We've been studying what the name represents. What's that? Character. That's the character. So in the future, well, let's go back to the, the, the Jerusalem one first. Uh, so what was the affliction that Jesus foretold? 
And if you turn to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 17 and 18, Matthew chapter 10, would someone like to read that for us? Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. But beware of men, for they shall deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Yes, and, and this was graphically fulfilled, wasn't it, with the persecution of Stephen. We had the person of the martyrdom. We had uh, Peter and John who were imprisoned and threatened. And, of course, Paul was accused of, uh, by before Felix, wasn't he, as a ringleader of a sect. Um, that's a bit worrying, isn't it? Uh, I hope, Adrian, you won't be looked upon as a ringleader of a sect uh, in, in the future. But I just threw that in. After the way they call heresy, so worship by the God of my father. Okay. Good. That's what he said. <laughs> okay. Um, just a couple of quotations. Um, in Acts 24, verse 5 says, For we have found this man a pestilent, pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. In Acts chapter 28 and verse 22, it says, But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And in Great Controversy, page 40, uh, we're told this, Christians were falsely accused of the most dreadful crimes and declared to be the cause of the great calamity. So all those pestilences and everything that were happening... Famine, pestilence and earthquakes. And as they became the objects of popular hatred and suspicion, informers stood ready for the sake of gain to betray the innocent. They were condemned as rebels against the empire, as foes of religion and pests to society. Won't be nice when someone calls you a pest. Because um, what do you do to pests? You exterminate them. <laughs> Yes, so John chapter 16 will be fulfilled where they deliver, you know, cast you out of the synagogues. The time will come when whosoever kills you will think that he's doing God a service. What will be the um, equivalent of the synagogues? Well, churches, I suppose. Churches. <laughs> so, yeah, well, look, it's not something I'm not looking forward to it. Um, so now looking at the worldwide spiritual application, we understand that John chapter 16 will, will be fulfilled. Um, but here's a quotation from Great Controversy on page 607. It says, As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, there will be a law invoked against commandment keepers. Blinded by Satan, the parent will exercise harshness and severity toward the believing child. Affection will be alienated. The heart can be very cruel when God's fear and love are removed. Prior to the last closing conflict, many will be imprisoned, many will flee for their lives from cities and towns, and many will be martyrs for Christ's sake into standing for the defence of the truth. So that's, that's the next stage. That's, we're not there yet. We've still got a, uh, we can praise God that we have a time of peace, time, of, uh, time to share with people that we know. So now, uh, verse 10, as we're going through Matthew 24, verse 10 says, And then shall many be offended and betray one another and shall hate one another. See, that word hate's come in twice here. They hated them and they, they hate. This is a bit scary because back then, it says in Desire of Ages, or, As this, the Christians suffered. Fathers and mothers betrayed their children. Children betrayed their parents. Friends delivered their friends up to the Sanhedrin. The persecutors wrought out their purpose by killing Stephen, James and other Christians. So that was literally fulfilled back there at the destruction of Jerusalem between AD 31 and AD 70. And of course there were false prophets, there were magicians and sorcerers we're told that arose trying to lead people into the uh, mountainous solitudes. Now the application for today is the same. Let's have a look at this from um, I found in the Review and Herald. It says here... These were, words will be fulfilled. Those who have been our companions in Christian association will not always maintain their fidelity. Envy and evil surmising, if cherished, will separate very friends. Mm -hmm. Have any of you had any friends that have sort of don't uh, talk to you anymore? Mm -hmm. We've sort of gone through a little bit of that. 
Those who are true to God will be menaced, denounced, prescribed. They will be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, even unto death. The scenes of the betrayal, the rejection and the crucifixion of Christ have been reenacted and will again be reenacted on an immense scale. So the betrayal of Jesus will be reenacted. This is going to happen. And so I guess if we're his followers. That in um, the Second World War in Nazi Germany. Yes. That yeah. To see how it went. Absolutely. And I, I remember when I used to massage at the sanitarium hospital, there was a fellow there called Jack Gator. And he, he had the marking on him. He, he was a Jew. There were seven in his family. They were all killed. And um, he re I remember him telling me the story. He gave me his booklet, which has gone. He sent it to all the libraries in the world. Uh, and he said to me, he said, Trevor, uh, when I was in Germany, he said, we were friends with all our neighbours, but when the propaganda went out, he said, we were hated. He said, we were hated. And um, I've never forgotten that man. He, he was a lovely man. Um, he, and the only reason he survived was because he was a tailor and he could be used in the German war machine to repair the clothing for the German soldiers. All his family were killed. Uh, and he survived and he went through, right through to out the Auschwitz camp. And I remember him, this is a diversion, but I, I remember him saying to me that um, when he was there, he was uh, saved by the Czechs right at the end of the war. And he said what they used to do was they used to, um, get, as the prisoners were becoming more and more emancipated, they would you know, strike their legs with cords and, and blood would bleed and the dogs would come up and rip them to shreds ripped them to shreds and man I just remember him telling me this and he said you know what he said I don't believe in God because I used to try to share my belief with him and he said they did this to me and I thought I was dead and he said I prayed and he said the dogs came up to him and walked around him they wouldn't touch him and he said you wouldn't believe it just after that happened a day or two later it was the end of the war and the checks came in and he was yeah it was an amazing story so we need to pray, you know, because the angels camp around about them that fear them and deliver them. Psalm 34, 7, we need to memorise these things. So a little diversion, but thank you for the diversion. Um, okay, so we went through that and the false prophets. Um, interesting, Jeff and I were on a walk last Sabbath, weren't we, Jeff? And we went for a walk and there were some Jehovah's Witness people, you know, going from door to door and... I thought it was someone that I knew, but anyway, they kept creeping up and sort of following us as we were walking. <laughs> and uh, anyway, they pulled over and we went up and said hi and we got talking. And anyway, we met Chrissy, Lisa and Jared, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, we got talking uh, about the gospel and we just said we'd just been talking about uh, on our walk about God. And it was just nice to be able to talk and tell them all about what God is really like. And they, they were really responding, weren't they? Yeah. They hadn't really heard it. Um, and Jeff was presenting about the law and how it works as a design law and how it's not imposed. And they were trying to say the law was... It was just really interesting. I, I'm looking forward to that time when people become more open-minded and study for themselves and are not caught by institutions that they have to look up to. Uh, we know that they're going to sever the bands from some of these institutions and think for themselves. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> okay. All right, and now verse, uh, Matthew 24 and verse 12. Uh, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. We're told in Desire of Ages, page 633, in the prophecy of Jerusalem's destruction, Christ said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. This prophecy will again be fulfilled. What's interesting to me now when we look at the spiritual worldwide application to this is that uh, the word iniquity, well, that word iniquity shall abound, that means sin shall abound, and sin is the transgression of the law, and we're going to see the results of legislation that is going to come in, which is sin, which is against the transgression of the law, opposed to God's law, and let's turn to um, Psalm 94 and verse 20, yeah. and we're going to read Psalm 94 and verse 20. And then I want to read Psalm 119, 126. So Psalm 94, 20. Someone want to read that out for me? And can you also read verse 21? Will the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? 
They gathered themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemned the innocent blood. So here's this law, and this law, I believe, is this law, which will be a contrary to God's law. This will be a, a Sunday law. Um, and we're told that they gather against the righteous through this, this law. If you continue to read, uh, yes. what's really interesting... Yes. Verse 22, yeah, stop. and 23. But the Lord is my defence, um, and my God is the rock of my refuge. And this ties in, of course, to Psalm 91, which is a time of trouble um, <coughs> psalm. But look at verse 23. And he shall bring, God shall bring, or God will allow in their own iniquity to fall upon themselves. And they shall cut, and that, and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Show the Lord how God shall cut them. It sounds as though God cuts off people. But you know what? We cut ourselves off. The sinner shall be holden by the cords of his own iniquity. It's not God. And it's the way you read the Bible. And, uh, but yeah, very clear again, it's their own iniquity. They're, they're, they're cut off by their own iniquity. And there's ample evidence in the Bible already about framing laws to achieve mischief, like the case of Daniel, the destruction of the Jews sure. at the time of our best days. It's, yep. it's right. Yeah, everywhere. Um, I'll just read out Psalm 119, 126. It is time for thee to work, Lord, for they have made void thy law. So, which is a transcript of his character. Which is a transcript of his character. And this is going to lighten up the world, isn't it? Because God's servants are going to go through and share this. Okay, now, this, the next one is the gospel going to the world. So before the destruction of Jerusalem, the gospel had gone to the then known world. Do you realise that? Mm. Before the abomination of desolation was seen, which we're talking about, Matthew 24, 15, the gospel had gone to the world. So let's just read Matthew 24, uh, verses uh, 13 uh, and 14. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto the nations, and then the end shall come. Okay. Um, Okay, let's just have a couple of verses just to show that the gospel back then was taken to the then known world. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 8, it says here, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Okay, now this is between AD 31 and AD 70. In uh, Romans chapter 10 and verse 18, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. And in, of course, we know in Acts chapter 1, it says that they were given the power of the Holy Spirit to the uttermost, uttermost parts of the earth. So this is important because before the abomination of desolation is seen, the gospel has gone to the world. Okay, this is interesting. Just remember these little points, whether you forget them or not. But anyway... Uh, so the gospel now in the, our application to the worldwide, uh, uh, the worldwide application of the gospel, the gospel has to go to the world again and before the abomination of desolation is seen. Let's have a look. We know this quotation in great controversy. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven by thousands of voices all over the earth the warning will be given, thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. The publications distributed by missionary workers have uh, exerted their influence and the rays of light now penetrate everywhere. And Mark says too that the gospel must be first published among the nations in Mark chapter 13 and verse 10. We're told also through the spirit of prophecy that through a large degree of the publishing work that the message will go to the world. But this is actually talking about the end of probationary time. Now, I want to make this clear that God doesn't have a, a line where he just cuts people off. Okay? But when everybody makes a decision, that isn't God cutting off, is it? No. no. There's nothing more God can do. Right? That, that, so when it says here, and the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto the nations, and then the end shall come, this is not talking about the the end as in the second coming. This is talking about the end of probationary time. This is the end when, when that's all that can be done. Once the gospel's gone and everybody's made a decision, then there's nothing more God can do. They've we know this. Uh, sorry? They've cut him off. They've cut him off. Yeah, in fact, if you read in Job chapter 22, it talks about the flood and it talks about the people there saying, depart from me. 
So they actually said, God, get out of here. We don't want you. Sorry, I remember Mark. Samuel, uh, God talking to Samuel, the prophet, about Saul. He says, Saul has left me. There you go. So I have left him. Yeah. yeah. It's just, it's basically rejection of God. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing more. I just read that, Job, chapter very recently. Oh, it's yeah. last week. Yes. And I've not read it before. Right. But that was the understanding we come to about the flood. And then to see it written there in the Bible. It's very clear. They said, depart from us. Yes. And God departed. And then destruction came on him. But he didn't bring it. And when you read that, it says that he filled their houses with good things. It mm-hmm. was... Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from God. So all their good gifts came from God, and yet they told him to buzz off. I mean, what more can God do? I mean, and yet he's a father. It's like all of us. We're father. Well, I'm a father, and you know, I would never say, I'd still be chasing after my children. You know, I wouldn't say just go away. If they said I don't want to see you again, that would make me super sad. I don't know about you, but it would make me super sad. Is that not the story of the prodigal? Yes. The father stood there waiting every day, looking yeah. so far down that road. And then he ran. He ran as soon as there was any sign that they returned. Yeah. Okay, so this, this is the end of probationary time because they've made their decision. Um, let me just read this. When the third angel's message closes, mercy no longer pleads for the guilty inhabitants. Why doesn't mercy plead? Because I don't want mercy. Okay. The people of God have accomplished their work and the preaching of the gospel to the world. The final test has been brought upon the world. Then Jesus ceases his intercession. He lifts his hand and with a loud voice says it is done. Okay. So now just some observations that I've had uh, on these, on what we were discussing. Number one, the Christians knew before the event, Jesus had told them, when you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel the prophet, he said, when you see that flee. Did the Christians flee? Yes. We're told that not one Christian lost their life uh, in the destruction of Jerusalem. So they actually obeyed when they saw Cestius surround the city in AD 66. Off they went. They fled. So Jesus had told them he didn't want them to be deceived. They understood. And you know, that verse actually says, um, understand. It says actually to understand. So no Christian lost their life in the destruction of Jerusalem. That's very, very important. So when the abomination of desolation took place, nobody lost their life. Okay. Uh, The Jewish nation, God's people had rejected the true son of God. They had accepted Barabbas, as Adrian just mentioned before. So they had accepted a false teaching. Um, They misunderstood the prophecies. They misunderstood the nature of the kingdom. They misunderstood the character of the Father. They misunderstood the law and what what its true meaning was. Yet, they still kept the Sabbath. They still kept the feast because it was at the Feast of Tabernacles when the destruction of Jerusalem occurred. And they sided with the civil powers of the state. And eventually they were led to kill God's true people so there was there was a lot now the thing is something interesting too is that uh, i'm going to bring this point out is that if you like after they preached the gospel and before the abomination of desolation takes place they're actually they were sealed if you like now before they went into uh this state god had sealed them because they had accepted the message and they and they and they fled do you remember jesus um, when the father spoke at his baptism and said, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, said, um, uh, had virtually given his seal of approval, right? And then what did he do? He went and met Satan face to face in the wilderness, which is interesting because I'm going to give you a quote in a minute. Okay, so now we come to Matthew 24 and verse 15. Um, so now we're right on the, on the thing and we'll almost be finished. Um, when you shall therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. And as I said, they, they understood and they fled and they were saved. And Matthew, uh, Mark repeats, Mark chapter 13 and verse 14 pretty well says the same. Uh, Luke 21 verse 20 and 21 says that uh, Jerusalem was compassed with armies or enemies that were intent on desolating the city. And in Luke chapter 19, it also talks, talks about the enemies compassing the city. 
And then when you come to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, it talks about, uh, I'll, I'll read this to you. And after three score and two weeks, 62 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince, which is of Rome, that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood or overflowing, and to the end of the war desolations are determined. So it's talking about this abomination of desolation here in Daniel, chapter 9, linking it with, uh, with Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, and how the city would be destroyed. And of course, we remember the words of Jesus when he came right into Jerusalem, and he said, your house is left unto you desolate. desolate. Your house is left unto you desolate. Um, I just want to put this quotation in from the Mount of Blessings. Occasions of irritation to the Jews were constantly uh, causing their contact with the Roman soldiery. With bitterness of soul, they heard the loud blast of the trumpet and saw the troops forming around the standard of Rome and bowing in homage to this symbol of her power. It's interesting to me that they, they were forming around the standard of Rome, right? And bowing in homage to this symbol of her power. I remember reading a quote that says Sunday uh, is the sign of her ecclesiastical power in religious things. And if Sunday becomes a day, then people will be, will be, if you like, forming around the standard of Rome and bowing in homage to her symbol of her power. Sunday is the symbol of her power. So my understanding, the abomination of desolation back there was armies surrounding the city and threatening to kill. And then they were given, that, that was the sign for them to flee. Yes. Um, uh, those things you were just saying made me think of Psalm 27. Mm -hmm. It talks about um, the Lord is my light, and then if there is a host of camping around me, okay. um, and for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his tabernacle, nice. in the secret of his oh, in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle, um, have mercy upon me. But then it took hide not thy face from me um, when my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord and the Lord will take, take me up. up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path. And the last verse is, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. Mm. Wait. Well, there's another abomination of desolation coming, which is now, that's, now we're right onto it. What is this abomination of desolation? It's interesting. I'll just read this um, little quotation from Mount of Blessing. When Jesus said, when you therefore shall see the abomination, that little word therefore, when you see the word therefore, you have to ask the question, what is it there for? Okay, well, what is it there for, right? Okay, well, we're told in the spirit of prophecy in the Mount of Blessings, it says the word therefore implies a conclusion, an inference from what has gone before. So in other words, once the gospel had gone to the world, when you therefore, after having all this conclusion, see the abomination of desolation, flee. So... In other words, when this abomination of desolation takes place for us, the gospel has gone to the world, everybody has made their decision, and then God allows something to take place. And then I'll tell you the reason here, he, he allows it to take place. Um, the gospel of God's character, isn't it? Going to all the world. The gospel yes, the gospel, of everybody. Yeah, yes. everybody gets a free chance to, to know the truth. To know the truth. So when people reject the truth, they are wide open to believe a strong delusion, to believe a lie. In, in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, it says, Because they receive not a love of the truth, yeah. God will uh, send, it says send, but you really should be, God will allow them yeah. to receive a strong delusion to believe a lie, that they might all be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in uh, deception. Okay, so now here's the quote. I said at the beginning there was a quotation in the Spirit of Prophecy that tells you exactly what the future abomination of desolation looks like and is and who it appears to. Okay, here's the quotation. Then I'll read something from a chapter in the Time of Trouble chapter in Great Controversy. Okay, here's the quote from... Now, this was originally in a compilation called Last Day Events and... Um, the problem is they left out the last little bit of the quotation. And, and that's why sometimes you, when you read compilations, you've got to go back and search out what's in the compilation. Okay, this is in uh, the quotation in Last Day Events. One effort more and then Satan's last device is employed. 
He hears the unceasing cry for Christ to come, for Christ to deliver them. This last strategy is to personate Christ and to make them think their prayers are answered. Full stop. But then if you go back and look in the original, it says here, but this answers to the last closing work, the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. It's actually Satan coming as Christ after the gospel's gone to the world and everybody's made a decision. And you might ask the question, why would God allow that to happen then? Well, this is where I'm going to now give you a bit of a, an overview. In Great Controversy, because it's chronologically written, uh, you've got your scriptures, your safeguard, you've got the uh, loud cry, you've got the time of trouble. And in the scriptures, your safeguard, that's what we have to do. We have to know our scriptures. We have to know how Jesus comes. And once we know these things, we need to rest on the word of God and believe these things. In the final warning chapter, or the loud cry chapter, it says that Revelation 18 is going to lighten this world with, with uh, a knowledge of his character. And it says there that every person is going to be given a chance to make a decision intelli intelligently. There's going to be three groups at this time that are actually uh, in the world. There's going to be those giving this message. Hopefully we'll all be part of that message. And there's going to be another group who, like Pharaoh, are resisting the truth and have uh, formulated themselves under this banner of Sunday. And there's going to be those who have the true, mess true message of the character of God and an understanding of his law. And they're going to be... So there's two groups, but then there's a third group in the very middle. And this is the, a group that God is trying to reach. It's called the, a multitude in the valley of decision. And it's during this time that everybody... The, you know, publications, everybody's going to, you know, the Sabbath's going to be the uh, point widely agitated. Everybody's going to have an opportunity to look at these things. We're told the clergy from the churches will put out superhuman efforts to shut out this line, this light, lest it should shine to their flocks. But those who are honest in heart, and God's not going to let anyone be deceived in this, everyone's going to have an opportunity to see the truth so that they can step out and take a stand for God. And isn't that fair? Isn't that what God would do? Amen. Would God not? Would God sort of say, oh, well, you know, you've got a little bit of error there, so sorry, you just missed out. God's not like that. Everybody's going to get an opportunity. And so when everybody's had an opportunity, then we're told that during this time and persecution, a lot of people will wake up and say, well, why, why are these people being persecuted? They're just doing something slightly different. So a lot of these people in the third group are going to make a decision. But there's going to be a lot of people who don't make a decision in that third group. You know, they just go along with the flow. or then So they haven't really showed their hand. They haven't put their hand up on either side. Then we're told that all of a sudden, in uh, um, Great Controversy, in the next chapter, Time of Trouble, it says Michael stands up. He stands up for the children of our people. And why is he going to stand up? Because they have decided that they, mm -hmm. first of all, they put fines and then... Um, imprisonment and you know some people will be bribed and uh, but finally there'll be a death decree right yep. and so God knows God actually knows when everybody's made a decision right he, he knows and so when probation if you if you like closes they've already made their decision it's not God closing their probation God has God knows that they've made their decision and so then the events happen in this chapter the time of trouble and this is where we go through Jacob's time of trouble. Yes? What, did, uh, what happened to that woman that was caught in adultery? Was her probation closed when she was thrown at Jesus' feet by the authorities? Mm. Didn't Jesus stand up? Yes. Just a thought. Great thought. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it in. <laughs> yeah, and so we've got this, this... So you've still got these three groups, and they might not be visible. There still might be this group here. There's two, but we know there's wheat and the tares, the sheep and the goats. How come there's three groups... So there has to be a third group. There has to be a separation somehow. And you know how that occurs? That ha actually occurs when Satan comes. Now, we know that the gospel has gone to the world and God, God doesn't allow people to be deceived during the time of the loud cry. Mm -hmm. If Satan was to come at this time, he would deceive heaps of people, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, would, they would just bow down at his feet. But we're told that once everybody makes a decision, then God allows Satan to pull off um, this, as she describes it, an over, uh, what is it? overmastering over delusion. And why does he pull it off? Because with the threat of death on our heads um, and Satan tempting us, 
to that we're going to be killed, that we're going to be forsaken and all this. He comes to us, he whispers, and yet he appears to the other people as a benefactor of the race. And then those people in that group who never made a decision we're told that the Sunday keeping people put up a shout saying, Christ has come, Christ has come. Say, so, see, this is, the, this is God. This is our long-awaited uh, ushering in of the millennium has occurred. And, and so the people in the third group who never made a decision, when he comes, like the Samaritans of old who bowed at Simon Magus's feet, they'll say, this is the great power of God. And they'll bow down and worship this being. And therefore they will show that which side they're on. This it's is a division. It's like they want to believe a lie. Well, there you go. Mm. Yeah. Uh, strong delusion. Strong delusion to believe. Strong delusion. That's it. So a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Yeah, and, and that quotation I, I, I shared earlier, where it said, "Those who exercise but little faith now are in the greatest danger of falling under the power of satanic delusions." Mm. You see, because if if you don't know the scriptures, then when this happens, you will bow down. Receive not the love of the truth. Receive not the love of the truth. So let me just read this quotation. Uh, from the chapter, The Time of Trouble, which is when probation is closed, if you like. I'll read this. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Saviour's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver, abomination, will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness resembling the description of the Son of God given by John uh, the Revelator. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed his disciples while he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. Because he was the choir master, wasn't he? In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Saviour uttered. He heals the diseases of the people, and then, in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. This is the strong overmastering delusions. Like the Samaritans who were deceived by Simon Magus, the multitudes, that multitude, see, in the valley of decision, from the least to the greatest, give heed to these sorceries, saying, this is the great power of God. But I like the next quotation, where it says, but the people of God will not be misled. They were sealed. They were sealed, you see. Before Jesus met Satan face to face in the wilderness, the Father had sealed him and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He was sealed and then he met Satan on the battlefield. It's really interesting. So, I mean, there's type anti-type here all the way through. Sorry, can I just make sure I understand what you're saying? Mm -hmm. So that there's the two groups, so that those, the gospel will go to all the world so that everyone can make a decision. You will have heard the truth. Yes. Um, and so the great deception, the great abom abomination, the desolation will not come upon all of us until everybody had been given the opportunity exactly. to yes. choose. It's in the chapter, the loud cry, the final warning chapter, <coughs> that everybody gets a decision to make, to make an intelligent decision. Yeah. And, uh, but there's still, still three visible groups. There's still three visible groups. But when Satan comes... That group in the middle, who might have appeared not to make a decision, they do make a decision. And it's, that's the division. That divides them. And it's not them hearing Satan hearing as Christ say that I've changed Sabbath to Sunday. Would that not then awaken people that had known about the Sabbath and then sort of fallen aside or anything like that? Well, that we're, we're told that no, that uh, it's in that chapter. And, and, this, and this is where our compilations have been a little bit uh, wrong. Um, they've all said, yes, Laurel. Um, I think it was in Steps to Christ, I might be wrong, but I remember reading a statement saying that to not make a decision for Christ is automatically making a decision for Satan. Correct. Mm -hmm. No offence And so really yeah. it looks like they haven't made a decision, but by not making the decision for, they automatically just... And that's why they against. bow down, because yeah. they, they're, they're told, well, this is him, oh, oh, let's go with the... They go by, faith, uh, by sight, mm -hmm. not by faith, mm -hmm. right? We walk by... Just to finish off Fiona's point, or at least 
refer to it from what you said before. When Satan appears as Christ, yes. there's no point hanging around. Mm, that's right, and that's why You're they not flee. You're be able to help anyone no. Correct. change their position, so that's the time to get out. Yeah. Yeah. Leave the cities, leave all the rest, because once he appears, yes. nobody's changing their position. Yes, yeah, so and it's actually he, that, if you read Great Controversy, he's the one that says to enforce it. Um, it's, it's interesting, as I said, with that word therefore, that, that uh, means a conclusion. That means when the gospel has gone to the world, right, then it says, when you therefore see the abomination of desolation, the conclusion was that the gospel has gone to the world right now, the abomination, of, it's time to go. And that's why it says flee. That's really encouraging, putting together um, Lester's thought with Lester's thought with Lester's thought with just the growing up as an Adventist, the fear that, oh, when Satan comes, will I be deceived? Because yeah. will, I, will I get overpowered by it? And, but we won't. We, we're, no. we're told that we would already have made fully our decision. Amen. And if we're deciding for Christ, then we're not going to get overpowered because it's all over. Yeah. Um, and, and then, yeah, we, we said, please. I mean, I could go on, but I mean, that's, that's basically the, the abomination of desolation. And, and, and we have been told what it is, clearly what it is. The manifestation of Satan. It's the manifestation of Satan. And uh, after the gospel has gone to the world, he appears. It's a, and in fact, she says it's a last desperate effort. It's a last desperate effort. If he has to sketch it, otherwise he's going to lose too many troops. Yeah, yeah. And interesting that he's the one behind this whole false counterfeit system of justice that we've been studying. Yes. About yes. Imposing the laws, and he comes to strictly enforce, enforce the law. And justice system is enforced. This idea that originated, originated the idea of punishment and affliction and death yes. and all that stuff that comes in with Sunday laws. Yes, it? yes. That comes as a being of dazzling brightness like this Messiah and false mm. Messiah. And because people have that mindset of false justice, they end up being deceived. Yes, correct. That's a very good point, Jeff. So even when Satan says that as Christ, that he says I've changed Sabbath to Sunday, it's too late then because to, yeah. the decision is... Well, he's saying, yeah, he's saying he's changed it to Sunday, right? Yeah. But this dazzling brightness, which they haven't seen, they've never yet seen anything like it. So the multitudes, just like in the book of Acts with Simon Magus, who was working miracles, they, the great multitude said, who didn't know what the Bible taught, they all bowed down at his feet. And so we're, we are to walk by faith, not by sight. This is the, that's why we need, as scriptures, our safeguard, treasure up the truth. Because when these things happen, you know, and don't forget there's going to be other false messiahs before that time, but the great overmastering delusion doesn't happen. And it's there written very clearly in great controversy. That's why I, I, I shared that quote earlier that says, the events connected with the close of probation and the time of trouble are clearly presented. But multitudes have no more understanding of these things. It's interesting, we're currently being programmed to do that. If you look at a new movie comes out, everybody flocks to see it. You know, a, a concert comes out, everybody flocks to see it. And the same thing will happen when, or, or there's big news, everyone flocks to see it. Yeah. And, and we're being programmed to do that. Definitely, definitely. Te television. <laughs> television. I'm done. <laughs> Would you like to have For a now. prayer? For now. All right. Let's all bow. Is this our chart, Trevor? Yes. Thank you. You can have that. I, did, I only did 20 copies. But that's it. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you that you have given us a chart pointing out the way marks on this journey and that we are not to guess at anything. We, we thank you that the events connected with the close of probation and the time of trouble are clearly presented. And why are they presented to us? Just like the early disciples, Jesus told them before those things came to pass, that when they did come to pass, we can believe, to strengthen our faith. So we really thank you, Lord, that we've got all these things on record. Help us to, to be not like the early disciples who forgot these important truths when times came. And uh, we just want to... Um, I know that at the end of the time, um, all of us are going to you know, be concerned with our life and, and, and struggle, but we have to invest in time in memorising these verses of the Bible that say he will save you out of a time of trouble. The, these type of quotations, that he's loved you with an everlasting love, because if we don't have these gems, Lord, it will be under the most discouraging circumstances that we'll have to live. 
So we thank you for all your promises throughout the Bible. There is numerous amounts. And we just thank you that we have the freedom to read today. We might be coming to a time when all of the Bible, all our spirit of prophecy books will be taken from us and then we'll have to stand as Noah, Daniel and Job did on our own. So we thank you for um, today. Thank you for all the people that have arrived and we just ask that you'll bless us for the rest of this Sabbath in Jesus' name. I'm sure you all appreciated the study. Amen. Can someone take a photo of the of the chart and put it into the Father of Love group for us? I tried to do it, but I've been logged out of my, my system. I just want those online to be able to see the chart. So uh, thank you, Trevor. I put some pieces together. And uh, we don't need to be in doubt about the events uh, that are coming, do we? So let's... Uh, Let's have a 10 minute break, shall we? 10.15, then we'll, uh, we'll start the next session. Thank you.